Christ. We live in a time where there are lots of uh, comic books, movies, TV series that feature superheroes. And in each of these superhero stories, there is some sort of superhero uh, costume, may not be the right word, uniform, whatever language you want to use to describe what it is that heroes wear. And there's a variety of uh, configurations of that, some of which include capes. Now, if you have seen the movie The Incredibles, you know that Edna Mode, who designs superhero clothing, would, uh, when it comes to capes, say... No capes. No capes. She knows that capes can uh, be a problem functionally, right? They can get in the way and they can uh, create disasters instead of allowing the heroes to go about their work. Today we hear from the Gospel of John, the second week in a row where we hear about John the Baptist. Last week we heard about, uh, from the Gospel of Mark, that John is this sort of eccentric sounding character that comes out of the wilderness, proclaiming this baptism of forgiveness of sins, right? Repentance, forgiveness of sins, and uh, confession. And so this week we encounter a different telling of the story from the Gospel of John. And it has a lead in. Uh, it tells us that uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John and that he was sent to testify to the light, but that he himself was not the light. So from this little prelude, we learn that John has a clear call from God and that he is not God. So he's got a calling. He's supposed to go and, and have some sort of proclamation, but he is not the light. He is just a conduit of the light. Then we get uh, skip a few verses ahead to the actual testimony that John brings in this conversation with some religious leaders. We know from these two accounts, last week and this week, that his proclamation must have been bold and dynamic and powerful because people were coming from all over the countryside, coming out from Jerusalem to be baptized by John. And in today's story, we hear that the Pharisees sent people to him to ask him if he was the Messiah. His preaching was so powerful and compelling that they thought he might be the Messiah, the one who could come and maybe throw off the empire and make all things well and new and whole again. And it's such powerful preaching then that draws these emissaries to him, and they then encounter a different eccentric side of John, not in his clothing, but in the way he um, isn't a great conversationalist with them. Uh, the first they say is, uh, are you the Messiah? And he says, no. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. He doesn't give them a lot to work with. So you can almost hear them pleading, right? Like, well, then tell us something about who you are. He then quotes the book of Isaiah and says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the paths. This then seems to irritate them. Because now that they've ruled him out as the Messiah and as Elijah and as the prophet, they want to know with what authority he comes out and baptizes. And he doesn't actually answer their question. The first part of his statement, he just says, I baptize with water. That doesn't answer the question of what right do you have to do this. He then says there's another coming uh, among us here that you don't know who is greater than I, whose sandal I can't untie, like I'm not worthy. Again, it doesn't answer their question. John seems to be a bit evasive with them as they bring all of this uh, curiosity to him about who he is. And what we find is that John is living in the tension between this call from God to bring this bold proclamation, but then some kind of understanding that he is not the light, that he is not the ultimate power, that he has some humility as he does it. So he has both a boldness and a humility. And it seems quite easy for John. Uh, there's another story where John sends some of his disciples to Jesus to ask if Jesus is the one. So we do know that John had some doubts and had questions, but it probably wasn't as easy as it sounds for him to just say, no, 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 I have a clear sense of what God has called me to. But what we find in this story as these leaders come to him is that they want him to be more of a hero than he understands himself to be. They want to put a cape on him and make him into the Messiah. And if not the Messiah, at least Elijah returned. And if not Elijah, then a prophet. They want him to put on some kind of cape and be a hero that can serve the people in a way that makes all things new and well. And John is not willing to put that cape 
on. This may be a hard story for us to wrestle with. If I were to ask you if any of you have ever been asked by anyone uh, because of your actions or words, if you are the Messiah, I would guess you might say no and that we may have a little trouble relating to John. But I would suggest to you today that we have plenty of times where we are expected to put on capes of unrealistic expectations. I think about those of you who are teachers right now, who 10 months ago were expected to be content experts in your classroom and maybe experts in managing children that are in front of you as you teach. And now 10 months on, in addition to that full-time job, you're expected to be a technology expert, a child psychologist to deal with the trauma that's going on with all of uh, what's happening in this pandemic, and continuing to teach kids that are in front of you and those that are online all at the same time while taking care of your own health concerns and risks for your family and your maybe children that are coming and going in their own uh, schooling, whether that's in person or at home. This is a cape of a hero of unrealistic expectations that we have asked our teachers to put on. I think also of uh, moms who work in the business world and go out and work 40 or more hours a week and come home to piles of laundry and dirty dishes and meals to be cooked and homework notebooks to be reviewed and signed and emotional support that the whole family needs. These are unrealistic expectations that one person can do all of this and yet we expect moms to put on these superhero capes and be those heroes that never fail and hold all of that together. I think about uh, some of you who care for your aging parents who may live in an assisted living or nursing facility and your siblings are hundreds of miles away and they expect you to make all the right decisions and be fully present and do all of the visits and caretake for those parents in a way that helps them to be whole uh, all the while having criticism from far away because they don't see what's happening on the ground, right? There's this cape of unrealistic expectations that you are expected to wear. Some of you have had jobs where you showed up into a place that had had a, a big mess of something and they expect you as the new person to bring your skills and everything to clean it all up and make it all better. I think too uh, of our kids, especially our high school kids, but all of our kids who are in these enormous pressure cookers of education where they have to pass the tests to keep going and the tests are long and challenging and they're not designed for every kid there are some who sell their uh, uh, attention medications that they take for their attention deficit disorders to other kids who don't need them but who want them to help them focus so they can get through the tests. Then there are lots of other unhealthy coping mechanisms that our kids have because we have expected them to put on sometimes a cape of unrealistic expectations. Now your story may not be in these stories, but all of us at times, whether other people put those capes on us or we put them on ourselves, find ourselves in spots where we have unrealistic expectations that go well beyond anything that we can do as a person, as a human being, and yet we strive to try to be those heroic people that hold it all together, make it all better, and fill those expectations that are placed upon us. That's where this story from John becomes an incredible gift of grace. We get that prelude that it says, John is not the light. It's almost like in an aside, right? He was sent from God, he's got a clear call, but he's not the light, right? He just testifies to the light. This actually, I have to imagine, was greatly freeing for John, that his job was not to be the Messiah, but point to the Messiah, to do this baptism, to make this bold proclamation, to announce all of this of the world, but not to save the world. He knew that his call had limits and his task had limits, and that Jesus was right there going to come and do the heavy lifting so that he did not have to be the hero. He did not have to put on that cape. It's fitting that this story revolves around baptism because in these waters of baptism, we talk about each of us being called. We talk about being welcomed into the, to the, to the Christian family. We talk about uh, forgiveness of sins and the promises that come with baptism. But we also talk about our baptismal vocation. And I would maybe even say vocations, because it's not just one thing that we are in the world. Uh, we have jobs and families and neighbors and uh, shopping marketplaces that we visit and all the other ways that we interact with the world around us. We are called through these waters of baptism into those places to be conduits of the light of Christ. We are called 
always to be pointing to Jesus and sharing our stories and our faith. And that work matters deeply. But we also are to remember that we are not the light. When we baptize uh, someone, we, we light a candle and we say, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not our light so much as it is the light of Christ that shines through us so that we are not the light. Even Jesus, the light, didn't put on a superhero cape. He didn't come into the world and fly around and save every single person and get everybody to a place of goodness and wellness and wholeness in this world. Instead of putting on a cape, he actually was put on a cross. And it's in that suffering and death on the cross that he meets us in all of the unrealistic expectations that we live with. It's in that place of weakness and failure that he meets us, not in a place of heroics. So, so that when he comes out the other side in the resurrection, again, it's not about success and victory so much as it is about new life and new opportunities that grow out of that place of struggle. So that our vocational baptismal calling isn't into success and victory. It's into places of suffering. It's into places of failure. We are called out into a broken world, not to be the light, right? There's no pressure on us in that way. We don't have to be the Messiah. We don't have to be the ones that hold it all together. This should be a freeing gift of grace that we are enough just as we are and just with what we are called to do and to be. I wonder if John woke up each day as he went out to give this bold proclamation and said, I am not the light just to remind himself of the limits of who he was as a human being. And I hope that maybe we can do that same thing, right? To understand that the work that we do in the world is amazing and wonderful. It can change people's lives, but we are not the light. The light shines through us. Jesus gives us the light. Jesus works through us, but we are uh, limited as people. And that's a gift that we don't have to do it all, just to be who we are, Trust that God created us as we are and to carry those gifts into the world knowing that God will change the world through us because Jesus is indeed the light. Amen.